Earlier in the course, we looked at comparative advantage. Here, we're going to take a look at it again as it applies to international trade. Countries have always engaged in trade. Uh, it's become more and more important even in the last 50 years. Some reasons for this would be following shipping and transportation costs. It makes trade easier and also more profitable. Some key terms here that we think about, you should be familiar with these. An import is a good or service that we that is bought domestically, but it's produced overseas. So if you buy you know, a BMW, so long as it's actually produced overseas, that would be an import. Uh, an export, on the other hand, would be a good or service that's produced domestically, but then sold overseas. And then we have tariffs. A tariff is just a tax imposed by a government on imports. So uh, you could think about the United States having a tax on the import of uh, sugar grown in other countries or rubber for tires or any, any number of things. The U.S. government imposes taxes on some imports. So traditionally, the way that countries have, appro have approached trade has been to impose high tariffs on imports, thinking that this would make their, uh, their own country, people in their own country, better off, both firms and consumers. On the flip side, of course, that means that the country's exports are also taxed by the, by the other countries. So looking at the U.S. here, we have imports as a percentage of GDP and exports as a percentage of GDP. Both of those are trending upward over time. Some more data here for you. You see that China is the world's leading exporter as of 2012. And here is international trade as a percentage of GDP. Notice that some smaller countries here, especially in uh, looking in Europe, trade is a bigger part of their economy as a whole than maybe, say, for the United States, which is a very large country, geographically diverse in uh, you know, natural resources and population, all that kind of thing. Trade plays a smaller part in the U.S.'s GDP. So we introduced comparative advantage a while back. Remember that comparative advantage is just being able to produce something at a lower opportunity cost than someone else. This is different from absolute advantage, which is it just is being able to produce more of a good, a good or service. Um, so this chart should be familiar down here, something like this. Um, and remember, the key thing here is that it's going to be comparative advantage that determines what a country should specialize in, and that even if one country has an absolute advantage in all resources, trade is still going to be beneficial for both for both countries. So let's just imagine this is, uh, these are the numbers that we're dealing with. Uh, this is, be careful to pay careful attention to what, how things are labeled here. This is output per hour of work. So in Japan, an hour of work can produce 12 cell phones or six tablet computers. In the United States, an, output, an hour of work can produce two cell phones or four tablet computers. So compared to advantage, you're thinking lowest opportunity cost. You should be very comfortable calculating the opportunity cost given a chart like this. Okay, well this is actually already done. From the chart on the previous page you should be able to get to this. Okay, so the way to think about this is, let's go back and look at the other one. Let's take a look here at this first one. The opportunity cost of, of Japan to make one cell phone is half of a tablet. So back over here we saw this relationship is 12 and 6. So for our opportunity cost, it's going to be all about this ratio. One is going to be 12 over 6, which is 2. The other is going to be 6 over 12, which is 1 half. All right, so if we go ahead and simplify that fraction, notice this is a 2 to 1 ratio. So when since it's 2 to 1 right here, that means that when Japan makes one tablet, it has to give up two cell phones. Okay, so that should show up here. When it makes one tablet, it gives up two cell phones. On the other hand, keeping that 2 to 1 ratio in mind, for it to make one cell phone, how many tablets would it have to give up? So we said this is a 2 to 1 ratio. We'd have to divide this 2 here. Remember, I'm thinking the 2 to 1 ratio. So divide this imaginary 2 here by 2 to get 1. And then that was left a 1 over here. So that leaves you 1 half. So to make one cell phone, they would have to give up half of a tablet. Okay. Uh, another way you could think about this would be, so we know that 12-6, that 6-12 ratio, so it's either going to be 2 or it's going to be 1 half. Whichever one of these numbers is the largest is going to have the smallest opportunity cost. So um, since under cell phones for Japan the number was 12, it's either going to be 12 or 1 half. It's going to be the smallest one of those because the 12 was the largest, so that's 1 half. So 
however you want to be able to think through that, make sure you can do this because it's going to be it's going to show up on your quiz. It's going to be something you need to do. So we'll do the same thing for the United States. It's still a two to one relationship here, though it is uh, the opportunity cost of cell phones is two tablets and the opportunity cost of a tablet is half of a cell phone. If the nations are in autarky, which is just no trade at all, uh, this would also be the relative prices of each in each, each country. So a cell phone would trade for half the price of a tablet in Japan and double the price of a tablet in the United States. So Japan would like to trade its cell phones for American tablets and vice versa based on these figures that we've calculated from the opportunity cost. Based on the numbers that we uh, were given earlier, let's say that each country has 1,000 hours available to produce. So in that time, Japan could produce 9,000 cell phones and 1,500 tablets. In the same time, based on the numbers that we're given, the U.S. could produce 1,500 cell phones and 1,000 tablets. So in total, we're looking at 10,500 cell phones and 2,500 tablets. So this would just be production without trade. This is production in autarky, what um, each country chooses to produce. Moving from no trade to trade, each country is going to specialize based on its comparative advantage. Whatever it has the lowest opportunity cost in, that's what that country is going to want to specialize in. So um, Japan is choosing to, to um, specialize in cell phones, and the U.S. is choosing to specialize in tablets. So if we go back to our opportunity cost thing here, um, that see each cell phone, Japan only has to give up half of a tablet. That is the lowest cost for Japan. To make tablets, the U.S. only has to give up half of a cell phone, so that is the lowest cost for the United States. So you can circle this one. Japan speci specializes in cell phones. The U.S. special, I mean, sorry, Japan specializes, yeah, in cell phones because it has the lowest cost here. And um, the U.S. specializes in tablets because it has the lowest cost in pro producing tablets. So now they've specialized, and when that happens, Japan is producing 12,000 cell phones, and the U.S. is producing only 4,000 tablets. So no other production in the other, in the other, um, the U.S. isn't making any cell phones, Japan's not making any tablets. The U.S. and Japan would like to trade. What would be an acceptable uh, terms of trade? Here we're just thinking about exchanging goods directly for other goods. We aren't thinking about um, yen and dollar prices, that kind of thing. We'll look at that um, in Chapter 19 for macro. And micro, you'll have to take macro to, to take a look at that. Uh, so the terms of trade, this is just the ratio that the goods are exchanged for. So um, obviously no country is going to accept terms of trade that make them that work, that work make them worse off. This is a voluntary exchange, and um, both parties would have to agree to the terms. So no country is going to accept terms of trade worse than its opportunity cost. If that was the case, it would just produce the goods itself. In this case, with the ratios, the way it's set up, a one-to-one -one trade would be acceptable. So one cell phone trades for one tablet. With those trade terms, we could end up here with this uh, level of production and consumption. So this is after the numbers, after trade, and they trade. They decide they're going to trade 1,500 and 1,500. So uh, Japan is only producing cell phones, but it's traded, and it's gotten 1,500 tablets. The U.S. is only producing tablets, but it's traded to get 1,500 cell phones. So here's a nice chart summarizing everything we've done. Here was production and consumption before trade. So this was in autarky. And now they've specialized right here. And then they've traded. So they specialized in what they had the comparative advantage in. Japan was um, cell phones. U.S. was tablets. After trade, this is what they end up with. So if you want to compare before trade and after trade, you would compare this, these numbers right here with these numbers right here. And you can see that both countries have increased consumption. Japan now has 1,500 more cell phones than it did before, this 10,500 versus 9,000. And the U.S. has 1,500 tablet computers more than it did before, uh, 2,500 versus 1,000. And the other two are, of course, we've kept the other two the same. That's we kind of set up the example that way so you could see they are definitely better off. So yay, gains from trade. In the real world, why don't we see complete specialization? Uh, not everything can be traded. Uh, like medical services, you know, sometimes you actually have to see the doctor. We've seen some changes in this with like teledoc and sending off x-rays to have that examined somewhere else. But still, you know, in some cases, you're actually going to want to see a doctor. You can't trade haircuts either. The person would actually have to be there. Um, 
production of many goods and services involves uh, increasing opportunity costs. So this would mean that we would see small amounts of production in lots of different places. And then taste for products can differ. Uh, cars, preferences about cars. Uh, so countries might have different comparative advantages and different subtypes for the products. So what's the bad news about international trade? It seems like it's going to be good for everybody, but this is true at the national level only. We can say that it, it is good at the national level. So some people, some firms or consumers are going to lose out because of international trade. Um, so in our example from before, you know, Japan specialized in cell phones. So it's, tele it's tablet computers. Uh, those firms and their workers are going to suffer. Just like in the U.S., because they specialize in tablets, the American cell phone market, uh, those firms and those workers would suffer. At the national level, obviously, though, there were gains from trade. Uh, people in the U.S. on the whole were, were better off, just like people in Japan were better off. For these firms and workers that were affected, though, we would expect them to ask their governments to implement some kind of protectionist measures, like tariffs, like we talked about, or quotas. This a quota would be um, just a limit on how much can be imported. So these are different things. Make sure to keep them straight, tariffs and quotas. So these uh, workers in these respective countries would probably like to see some kind of government intervention on their behalf. What causes comparative advantage? Lots of different things. We can think about uh, climate and natural resources. You know, Japan is uh, an island. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources, so it's, it's going to have different um, trading and comparative advantage than, say, the United States, which is very large and has diverse natural resources, uh, the relative abundance of capital and labor, uh, high skill versus low skill workers, infrastructure levels, those kind of things, technological differences, and um, external economies. So, uh, you know, you could think about a tech firm being located in Silicon Valley would be a lot different from, say, a, a tech firm, you know, in... Um, Tallahassee, Florida, for example, or in some other country. So uh, different kind of external economies that could lead to comparative advantage. Comparative advantage also changes over time. For a long time, the U.S. had the comparative advantage in consumer electronics like TVs and radios. The last TV that you bought, where was it made? It was probably not made in the U.S., right? Um, the, the giants now, you'd think of like Sony or Samsung, um, those are, it's a Japanese company and then a Korean company. So over time, we've seen that uh, Japan has now a comparative advantage and Korea has a comparative advantage in consumer electronics. At the same time, though, as wages are rising in Japan and Korea, there is starting to be some consumer electronic devices being produced back in the United States. So uh, in 2013, Apple announced that the Mac Pro, the 2013 Mac Pro, would be assembled in the United States. So compared to point here, compared to advantage changes over time. The last big thing you're going to want to do in this chapter is to be able to do the consumer surplus, producer surplus kind of uh, framework in terms of international trade. So we're going to look at a lot of things here with uh, um, quotas and imports, how that would affect this analysis. You'll want to be very familiar with all of that. Um, that you can expect that on your quiz. So let's say here is the U.S. market for ethanol. Before any kind of trade, we have our market price and equilibrium. Uh, this would be our consumer surplus, and this would be our producer surplus down here. Let's add trade now to this market, and let's assume that the world price for ethanol is $1 per gallon. So because this is lower than the domestic price for ethanol, Americans are going to import. Uh, consumers will benefit from the cheaper ethanol. This is going to hurt producers. So how can we say that trade is beneficial overall? We have to compare the economic surplus in the market before and after trade. So here's our initial diagram. We've added this world price, which is now the effectively the price market price in the United States. So uh, we get new quantity uh, demanded and supplied. Here is the um, quantity of ethanol supplied domestically. Here is the quantity of ethanol demanded domestically. And this difference gives us the amount that's imported. So consumer surplus is going to be this large triangle here all the way down to the world price. Producer surplus will be up under the prevailing world price. And overall, we can see that after trade, the U.S. Um, people in the U.S. On, on, on net is actually better off. So not everybody wins from trade here, as we saw in this example, but the gains to the winners outweighed the losses to the losers. Overall, Americans are made better off by this, having this trade. 
As far as your quiz, you also need to look at tariffs. Apply tariffs to this diagram. That's definitely going to show up on your quiz, so be ready for that.